um, a recent report from the National Academies called The Promise of Adolescence, um, a great uh, overview of adolescent health, including um, factors associated with resilience. And there's the, uh, the link for the, the free download of a P the PDF of this report. And then um, a couple others to highlight. The Harvard Center on the Developing Child is a great resource. Um, they have an ongoing podcast series called The Brain Architects. Um, and it's advertised there to the right, learn the science behind how brains are built and, and how to build a strong brain. And this is the website um, for that link. They update you on when their podcast um, has a new episode. If you're interested in a good TED Talk, um, after searching high and low, this is the one I like the best, from Sarah Jane Blakemore. She's an expert, but she speaks um, on a layperson's level, The Mysterious Workings of the Adolescent Brain, kind of like the title, and I think there's some truth to that. It's about 20 minutes. Very helpful. It's a, it's a good one for parents and teenagers. And then some publications. Um, this is a journal article. I can send it to you uh, if you want a copy. It does a nice job of talking about how our knowledge of adolescent brain development can inform therapy and how we do treatment. I'll get into some of that um, soon. And then two books that um, don't directly talk about adolescent brain development, but I have found them helpful for people doing therapy, particularly if you like motivational interviewing and if you're doing brief interventions, these two books um, are edited books, have a lot of chapters. They do a nice job, most of the chapters, of making sure that uh, they've integrated knowledge about uh, teen brain development in the content they provide. Here is a three item quiz. And we're gonna return to these quiz items at the end of my talk. First one's true false. There are several health indices suggesting that teenagers take less risk than in years past. Is that true or false? Second one, what lifestyle choices during adolescence promote good brain development? And the third, it's multiple choice. Which is more harmful to the developing brain? Chronic heavy use of marijuana or chronic heavy drinking? More on those later. And here is the four main topics. I'm a, a brief overview of brain development. My apologies to those who have heard me give this talk before. Um, some of this is repeat, oh, there's some new material, uh, but I wanna give everyone a kind of the basic overview. Um, but then the, the heart of the talk is number two, where we'll talk about the developing brain and its impact on drug use risk and mental health and how early experiences are important for the developing brain, both in positive and negative ways. Third section, what you can do with this material to improve your work in the treatment and prevention field. So I've got several things to talk about there, and then I'll summarize. Um, keep in mind that the science I'm presenting is complicated and it's not in any strict sense definitive. It's virtually impossible to do the kind of controlled studies that would be needed to prove something is a, is a definitive cause and effect. So uh, sometimes uh, articles and authors and maybe even me uh, fall prey to confirmation bias where you're kind of looking in one direction for a conclusion and you might slant how you interpret something be based on a conclusion you've already reached or that you're in favor of. And many studies have small sample sizes or when they're doing follow-up, it's, it's too small a time window for people to feel like it's, it's clearly definitive. So many times we have to argue that the jury is still out. Some data is community level and some is individual level. And sometimes um, uh, people are making assumptions about individuals when it's community level data they're looking at. And we all know there's big individual differences. And so uh, we have to use community level data as broad interpretations of health and, and trends um, and better individual level data can, can be more precise. And then a reminder that um, while I'll talk about possible connections between brain development and how that translates to adolescent behavior, keep in mind that that's a somewhat problematic link because it's uh, virtually impossible to directly um, prove that there's a, uh, a, a one-way link between a brain 
brain function and structure and how people behave. Obviously, there's uh, plenty of, of important inferential data that we can use to um, hopefully inform our thinking. But keep that in mind that um, the science is, um, in some ways, not ideal. Another introductory note. I'm, I'm spotlighting with this talk um, how brain development impacts adolescent behavior. And I don't want to diminish the impact of environment and social determinants on adolescents, their behavior and attitudes. I am going to be talking to some degree about it. It's not the, the heart of my talk, uh, but I, I don't want you to think I'm, I'm um, de-emphasizing the important role of non-biological influences because they are important. And that's where some of the new science is going, how, how those um, so-called environmental uh, experiences, whether they're positive or negative, do impact the brain development and then eventually impact behavior. More on some of those. Um, I thought I'd give you a summary of my talk right up front. Here's the main points. Um, not a news bulletin from uh, the literature, the maturation of adolescent brain likely contributes. I didn't use the word cause, but likely contributes to behaviors that are characteristic of this developmental period. Um, I think there's growing evidence that this maturation helps inform our understanding of the risk period during adolescence for substance use and substance use disorders, as well as risk for other behavioral disorders, including psychosis, depression, suicidal ideation, et cetera. I also wanna emphasize how you can leverage this information to help in your work with teenagers. And I'm, I will be highlighting six ways you can use this information um, in many settings and many goals when you're working with young people and parents, um, including teaching brain development, using evidence-based practices, and um, informing parents about this science. As you can see under number five, I have an increased youth cannabis and vaping IQ. It's my way of reminding us all that uh, the cannabis use phenomenon and vaping, whether it's uh, nicotine or cannabis, is an uh, unfortunate trend in the wrong direction from a health standpoint. And so um, it probably needs to be an important focus for people in their prevention work. And treatment people are finding that it is, uh, you know, substances of, 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 uh, of need uh, to address during treatment. Okay, brief overview. There's some basic principles uh, to highlight about adolescent brain development. It, it's uh, been determined a few years ago, and it looks like it's been confirmed since, that one could make a case that the brain matures in significant ways through adolescence up until about age 25. Now, that's a provocative age um, in some ways. Uh, when you look at the, um, the more detailed data, one could make a case that by about 18 or 19, um, the majority of the maturation, basic maturation process is complete, but there is still uh, maturation going on until about age 25. Um, keep in mind there's individual differences and uh, scientists are thinking there's gender differences as well with girls likely maturing maturation wise, biologically wise, a little faster than boys. The other a big principle is that the way the brain develops is not in a uniform way. Uh, the brake systems in your brain, which are at the front of the brain, they develop a little slower than the back of the brain, which is the so-called accelerator or gas pedal system. So think of roughly, metaphorically, the brain having kind of a regions that are associated with the brakes and regions that are associated with um, accelerator, gas accelerator. And those two regions, um, which are distinct uh, biologically and uh, physically in the brain, they mature at different rates. And so not only is maturation going on significantly during adolescence, it's going on in a pattern that is differential and that can lead to interesting interpretations of adolescent behavior. Um, the front or brake part of the brain is often called the judgment region or the prefrontal and frontal cortex. And the limbic or accelerator regions are near the back and they are more associated with motion motivation. So um, you have this differential maturation. So what's maturing sooner? The limbic region, which you could make a case then is dominating over the uh, judgment region or the front of the brain. Um, I call it the Nike brain. It's sort of a brain that says, let just do it without thinking or pausing and reflecting. Um, this time lapse 
um, representation here is the mat one maturation process called synaptic pruning. You can see it kind of envelopes, but the, the major region in the front is more last to get blue than, than other regions. So one way to talk about adolescent brain development and, and behavior is that you could make a case that while the adolescent brain is, is quite effective and it surely can do a lot of things and cognitively it's, it's prepared to do a lot, it's not necessarily at its optimal function in part because your judgment region might get hijacked or overtaken by uh, the limbic emotion motivation regions, more so than when you're an adult. As an adult, you at least got brain regions that are working in sync, not that you don't always make good judgment and sometimes emotions, of course, overtake us all. But um, the, the notion is that it's this problem of emotions and motivation somewhat uh, superseding good judgment is more of a problem when you're a teenager than when you're an adult. So psychologists have weighed in. Uh, what does this mean for implications of adolescent behavior? This is a list my colleagues and I developed years ago by reading this developmental psychopathology and psychology literature. And so we came up with what we thought was some consensus of eight principles of where brain development might be contributing to certain preferences or tendencies during adolescence. Now, if you thought about one through eight, you will notice one thing. Well, all of them are relevant to human behavior and, and um, uh, in general. And that's right, they are. The point is that during adolescence, these things may take on more prominence. So just take um, number three, that's a biggie. Activities with peers is a preference, particularly when the teenager senses that activity is gonna to lead to some high intensity or excitement. So we all like excitement, we all like our friends, but the notion is that with adolescents, um, you may weight decisions and choices very heavily, more heavily, because you see the attraction of time with peers more so than as an adult. I'm not gonna go through all eight of them. I will uh, return to them in several ways. Um, and one of them is this. So we went through the list and said, well, okay, these things all could actually be within normal range and not lead to big problems. But do some of them lead to, or maybe contribute, particularly if they're exaggerated in, in teenagers, to unhealthy behaviors? And we looked at the list and we, we actually noted all of them except the first one. So if, if, you, if your emotions got the best of you, if you were just overly excited to take risks, if you let peer pressure get to you, excitement get to you, et cetera, in some ways that could lead to making bad decisions about your health. And then we thought the other end of the spectrum, well, what about maybe these things are positive and they could lead to personal growth and lead to favorableness lead to uh, skills and resilience and coping. And we highlighted less. We, some of them are the same as the other list, but we thought um, the first four made sense as well as taking risk, which can be a, a personal growth trait. Not being so comfortable that you don't try something new, you don't learn, um, you don't see what you're good at, and you don't take advantage of learning to be better at it, you know, trial and error, et cetera. All that is, is uh, inherent in taking risk and surely could help a young person develop to be the best they could be. More on that list later. Um, but taking risk, which is the eighth one on, on that prior slide, is uh, worthy of a slight sidebar commentary. Uh, a lot of science about risk taking. I think it's extremely relevant to think about during the teen years because in theory, people are probably um, edging towards the higher end of what their risk-taking comfort zone is. You know, risk-taking is believed to be a human trait that's adaptive and probably in some ways can be considered um, distributed in a normal distribution form. So most of us are kind of average risk-takers, which might mean it's fairly healthy and we don't get in big trouble. Some of us are at the way low end and some of us at the way high end. But, um, Risk-taking in teens has gotten a lot of attention in part because people thought, well, teenagers are, are such crazy risk-takers. What is going on there? And the, if you look at the science behind it, the 
the basic notion is that the teenagers have a, have a true sense of what is risk. They don't have a cognitive deficit of what is uh, uh, unhealthy or over the top behavior. The problem is they don't necessarily use that knowledge to control that risk-taking behavior in the throes of an exciting moment. So the belief is it's risk-taking that you tend to see in greater um, levels here in the adolescent years is um, and heavily due to emotional and contextual factors, not to some cognitive deficit. This was interestingly shown with driving behavior. This is a bit complicated slide. So I'm gonna go right to what the big um, bottom line uh, conclusion was that adolescents, when they were with peers in a simulated driving task, they were very prone, more, I should say, they were more prone to take a simulated driving risk than the two other age groups. But when the peers were not with any of the age groups, the younger age, teenagers, they did the same, or you could make a case, drove with the same ability as the other age groups. So risk taking wasn't inherent, but it only was triggered when the teenagers then in the simulated task were able to bring a friend and sit next to them in the simulated car. The belief is, see, that might have impacted their, you know, willingness or desire to want to brag. They got excited by maybe showing off to their friend. There's an emotional feature to it. Uh, maybe the peer is even egging it on, and that further compounds the teenager to take more risk. This was simulated driving, so they could, um, you know, do a lot of features to control for it. Don't worry, these were not actual crashes or actual risky decisions, but it was a big peer effect. The peer effect didn't show up for the other age groups. Okay, let's go to the, um, really the heart of the talk, talking about now um, brain development and its intersection with drug use, behavioral disorders, and early experiences. So there's really three big themes. Um, let's talk about drug use first and adolescence. Um, the, the question I'm gonna tackle first is the one posed by Linda Spear some years ago. Um, and she did a good job of thinking this through. All of us are prone to the susceptibility of drugs by virtue of uh, the ways our, our brains are wired. Obviously, there's individual differences there. So the question really is, though, are adolescents more susceptible to the effects of drugs than the older age groups? And so there are several lines of evidence. This is clearly where you got to be careful. There's no perfect study. Uh, it, some of it's very inferential and indirect. And then animal models have been used as well, because you can control some things with animal models, but keep in mind, it's animals. Now, it turns out mice or rats, you can get uh, them intoxicated, and they tend to show some behaviors that are similar to humans. So it's been a model uh, in, enjoyed by scientists. Anyway, uh, first line of evidence is just from survey data. And if you look at the big picture of uh, drug use, modern times, across ages, on average, most people in the Western cultures tend to escalate their drug use during their teen years and then de-escalate at the, at the end or the beginning of young, end of adolescence or beginning of young adulthood. In fact, interesting, if you look at the data closely, the age at which you really see the, the start of the drop off of drug use is, you could fill in the number because I've already given it to you, 25. Interestingly so, right around 25. Um, anyway, so it is a period of time of risk um, if you look at developmental picture. Obviously, some of us escalate our use um, um, and some of us don't use it all in the teen years. You know, I'm talking about big picture. But most of us, uh, probably the majority of us um, joining us today, if you look back, you probably could say, yeah, I guess... Uh, I experimented the most or got the riskiest or binged the most or tried the most poly drug pattern when I was the youngest. And then I wised up and slowed down and maybe even stopped. Um, now, another related factor is the age at which you start does contribute to risk for later addiction. This slide shows two bar graphs, one for alcohol and one for marijuana, the same pattern for both. The earlier the age at which you started to use the greater the risk of having a lifetime addiction. So it's lifetime risk downstream, and it is uh, intersecting or a function of how early you started. 
the pattern is the same for both alcohol and marijuana. It's more dramatic with alcohol, but you see the same phenomenon. If you go to the far right, the 21 plus number, you can see the bars are the lowest. So you're under 10%, under 5%. You can wait to start using substances um, that reduces that risk way down to the lowest level of a future addiction problem. The alcohol data with um, animal models is interesting. If you um, get adolescent mice intoxicated, you can show and demonstrate that they're less sensitive to the acute effects of intoxication. Here's my slide from Kim Harris. She developed this cartoon. It, it just shows the study that was done with mice, um, mice that were adolescent mice that were intoxicated had an easier time swimming than adult mice that were intoxicated. And the notion was that that adolescent mouse or rat was more tolerant, able to handle uh, intoxication better than adults. So that's an interesting phenomenon. If, if adolescent person, adult, uh, or human, I mean, can handle alcohol better than an adult, that might contribute to binge drinking. Then they looked at uh, the social sensitivity of alcohol comparing adolescent and adult mice, and lo and behold, adolescent mice are more sensitive to the social effects. Um, and what are those effects? It's called social disinhibitory effects of alcohol. You get more socially comfortable and confident, and you can do these studies that um, can, it encourage mice to be sociable, and sure enough, Adolescent intoxicated mice showed greater sociability behavior than uh, the adult mice that were intoxicated. So it's kind of a bad mixture. The, uh, the negative effects of alcohol, less so in adolescent mice. The positive effects of alcohol were more uh, prominent in adolescent mice. Kind of a, it's a bad mix. I'll return to this slide a little later. Um, I want to jump to marijuana. There's um, you know, more data now on issues of marijuana and cannabis. Of course, we're mostly talking about THC when we talk about the marijuana plant and, and our concern that it might have negative health impacts. Uh, a reminder that THC um, uh, does bind or activate many regions of the brain. To the left um, is the list of possible impacts, including brain development, and then look at all the cognitive and, uh, and other be human behaviors that can be impacted by THC activating these multiple regions. So, it does make sense, either you may know this from personal or you've talked to people or read about it, how getting high on, on THC does have an impact on a person's sensation, appetite, cognitive thinking, attention to humor, inattention to driving, interest in music, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, more so than a lot of other drugs, which maybe tend to just have a mood impact uh, or more local impact, but marijuana goes way past mood and uh, definitely dabbles into uh, physical coordination and cognitive functioning. So it is a concern. The adolescent brain, by taking a lot of THC, is, is now activating um, a lot of parts of the brain. So how do we summarize the effects of chronic cannabis use? There's several publications. I thought I would, though, highlight uh, Nora Volkoff's uh, summary paper in 2014. It actually is not outdated. If you look at the publications from 2020, they pretty much um, just further uh, reinforce what was known back in 2014-ish. Um, so I've summarized for you how they uh, reported the data, low level of confidence for one health issue, and then medium level and high level of confidence for the other seven. You can see they, they span cognition, risk for future drug use and addiction, uh, impaired driving. We'll get into um, the issue of increased risk for mental disorders. And then this slide next, I've colored um, half of those eight in green. Why did I color them in green? Because in the Volkoff article, they noted these four show a greater, more pronounced risk of occurring if someone starts to use marijuana in the adolescent years. So the level of confidence would even be a little higher for all of these if you're an early onset user, adolescent onset user. Altered brain development, increased risk for chronic psychosis, addiction, and diminished life satisfaction and achievement, which as a teenager could mean poor school grades, less likely to graduate, less likely to go to college or do well in college, and perhaps a diminished uh, uh, career trajectory. 
So back in 14, that was already an issue. I thought I'd briefly highlight an interesting study that was longitudinal, so it's stronger than many of the others that are cross-sectional, and that also um, looked at change in IQ. You may have heard of this New Zealand or Dunedin study. It was published in early 2012, um, briefly, because it's got you know, some strong data and an interesting conclusion. Um, it was a sample of, of citizens in this town in New Zealand that was recruited when they were infants, but at age 13, they started uh, giving an IQ and other cognitive tests. So age 13 is important for my story here. And then if you go way to the right, the other yellow age, sorry, red age is 38. That was when they repeated the IQ test. So it's a longitudinal sample of about a thousand. Um, at age 13, IQ test developmentally appropriate, age 38, repeat IQ test developmentally appropriate. In between, you see three other ages, 18, 21, and 32. These are the three other assessment periods in the longitudinal sample. Now, I've got this slide that colors in green, 18, 21, 32, and 38, because that was the years they asked all the participants about their substance use behavior, including have you used, frequency, duration, and did you meet diagnostic criteria? I put a box in 18 because that's important. It was the first time they asked about marijuana use. And it also allowed them to determine if somebody had already used or not, if they were an early onset user. That is before age 18. So they're able to categorize individuals uh, if you were early onset or not. And then of course, the chronicity of use, if, if any, in the subsequent years. Okay, the IQ data is here. It's a little um, confusing chart. The red bars mean the most to us for today. They represent the subsample of individuals that said they started to use marijuana before age 18. So they're called the early onsetters. And then there's three groups, one diagnosis, two diagnosis, three diagnosis. You see how there's three sets in the, in the columns. Uh, that meant across those four time frames in green where they were asked about drug use, whether they had a diagnosis of cannabis use disorder once, twice, or three, three or more times. And I put in the, uh, the call out box what the key data was, that among those that were early onset users that were chronic, there was a average eight IQ point drop from age 13 to 38 on average. Um, some had more, some less. Eight, eight points is about half a standard deviation for this uh, IQ test. It's pretty significant, it probably you know, means there is likely, um, depending on the person, um, some um, evidence, not direct, because no one was able to directly measure that, of some of decrement in, in life function. And keep in mind, if you had a very high IQ and you lost eight points, it wouldn't matter much. But if you're at the average, you know, let's say you're 105, 101, 103, at average, which is very functioning, but if you lose eight points, you know, that, that puts you below average, and that could have an impact. I'm giving you this slide with these little white boxes and numbers to remind you that because it was only a thousand cases that met the criteria of this study, um, see how the small sample sizes for this for these subgroups. You, had, you know, it had to be marijuana users, diagnosis or not, early onset or not. So it's small, small numbers. That means the uh, confidence um, of the conclusion has to be uh, laced with caution. There are um, other studies looking at this more rigorously, including uh, a big study in the United States that's trying to recruit 13,000 young people instead of just 1,000. So downstream in years to come, we, we might have uh, uh, data that'll be more confident because of larger uh, sample sizes. So I'm gonna re um, turn to the question of are adolescents more susceptible than adults to drugs? Um, it's I think the evidence is compelling that it's quite suggestive. Then what is the reason? So why is that? Is it because some of the inherent brain development based behaviors of adolescents are contributing to this? Here's our list again. And if you look at the ones I put in red, you can make a case Well, all of those could tend to lead to a young person to think about, hey, um, I'm kind of curious about drugs. I'm not too worried about long-term effects. My friends are using. I understand it helps with my emotions, maybe even calms them down. Um, and thus, um, people 
young people might be at risk just by virtue of being an adolescent. And if you give someone opportunity, that surely could lead to that behavior. Another concern is that um, the adolescent brain is quite sensitive to the acute effects of drugs, more so than the adult brain, based on what the underlying neurobiology of drug addiction is. So you may know uh, uh, there's a, a core biological principle at play when you take all of the psychoactive drugs. And the core story, the main story, revolves around uh, the increase or acute increase of dopamine, which is essentially a pleasure neurotransmitter. It creates a nice rewarding feeling, euphoria, high, feeling good, feeling pleasurable. Um, it's what increases when you hear a good joke, see a friendly person, etc. cetera. Um, but it, it significantly increases the uh, production acutely of dopamine. The concern is that with teenagers, their dopamine system is, is too sensitive. It's called having a robust dopamine system. And this robustness might mean that um, the adolescent brain compared to an adult brain is actually just more sensitive to the initial facts. So it's just getting a greater, more intense squirt of dopamine. And this, of course, could contribute downstream to greater motivation to keep using and even a, lead to greater difficulty in reducing use because it was so rewarding. Then there's a the concern that early use may create a biological priming or gateway to future use. In other words, that if you use heavily in the teen years, not only are you getting this acute phenomenon, but the uh, possible chronic changes that could occur, structural changes could occur, um, might lead to uh, more interest in continuing to use, or even if you stop using, you might return more readily. Um, nicotine's been studied in this light. Um, one a uh, rat study looked at the, what happened when two samples were uh, studied of, of rats. They're both adolescent rats. One adolescent rat group was allowed to access nicotine. The other adolescent rat group was not. Okay, then they waited till these two groups grew up as adults. And then they allowed the two separate groups to self-administer nicotine if they wanted to or not. And this is the data here. Um, the, the group that had adolescent exposure to nicotine um, self-administered nicotine at about twice the rate of, of the, uh, the rat that didn't have earlier exposure. A indirect piece of evidence suggesting that uh, there were some changes in that early exposed rat and that might have contributed to later interest in, in self-administering nicotine. If you're more interested um, on what's called the nicotine gateway effect, there's a pretty good review study um, done by Wren and colleagues. And you can see my conclusion there um, that there is a large and growing clinical and preclinical evidence that at least adolescent may, um, adolescent exposure to nicotine uh, may influence molecular, biochemical, and functional changes in the brain that encourage subsequent drug abuse. People are studying this for the other drugs as well. As you can imagine, if, if people are finding it with uh, a potent drug like nicotine, they're going to be quite worried about. Uh, alcohol, marijuana, and other drugs. Okay, let me move to uh, section two in this intersection uh, point about brain development and, and um, health. And that is uh, my discussion about brain development and behavioral disorders. The big picture is that um, there is concern that if neurodevelopment doesn't go well, for various reasons, and it could be because of drug use, but for other reasons that might be uh, inherent, might be a biological vulnerability, that can contribute to several adolescent onset mental and behavioral disorders. I've listed here several that are um, well-established, I would think in the literature, and that many of them have um, either full-blown onset in adolescence or they have um, uh, pre-morbid versions of it, particularly schizophrenia, which can have early signs of, uh, of uh, disordered thinking, not full-blown schizophrenia, maybe until later. But many mental disorders that, that receive treatment and that are uh, part of the human, be, human experience have adolescent onset. And there is concern that um, neurodevelopment that has gone awry may be um, contributing to this. Um, how common is it that disorders onset in adolescence? This was asked by Kessler and group when they looked at 
um, epidemiology data in the US and they charted here, what is the 50 percentile age of onset for four disorder categories? So the numbers you see above the orange boxes is the age at which 50% of people that eventually had the disorder that's labeled for that box had that disorder at or before that age that's above the box. So let's just take any impulse disorder control, any impulse control disorder box, number above it is 11. So the national data suggests that if you're gonna have that disorder sometime in your life, now that includes ADHD conduct disorder, oppositional de defiant disorder, and antisocial personality disorder, if you're gonna have any of those four in your life, 50% of people that have that disorder show um, significant signs of it by age 11. Obviously, after 11, the other 50% um, develop it. But you can imagine if many are developing before age 11, I mean, still during a lot of adolescence, people are unfolding that disorder. I thought I'd do a quick sidebar on adolescent use, marijuana, and behavioral disorders because the literature on it is growing. And if you think back to that one slide about all the um, cannabinoid regions in the brain that are impacted by THC, you can imagine that maybe it uh, alters mood, decision-making, regu emotional regulation, and then that may contribute to uh, behavioral disorders. An excellent review was conducted by Miller. I can send you the uh, chapter uh, of hers that reviews this. I summarize it in the following way. She thought there was enough data in the literature to talk about five disorders, schizophrenia, bipolar, anxiety, depressive, and risk of suicide. And then she um, summarized after rigorous review how strong the cross-sectional data and the longitudinal data were in indicating or suggesting that there was a strong link between marijuana use and those disorders. So I put in a double plus symbol where Miller said there were several studies suggesting a link between marijuana use and the disorder. There's a single plus if it's just a few studies and there's a blank if there were none or virtually none. As you can see, there's not as many longitudinal studies or data as cross-sectional. Schizophrenia or psychosis is the strongest data, but there surely is uh, reasonable data, provocative in the wrong direction for all the disorders. Why did I put in yellow box, schizophrenia, bipolar, and risk suicide? She also noted which ones showed more prominence of linking marijuana and the disorder if the marijuana use began in adolescence, and she identified those three. That harkens back to the um, uh, summary of the literature by Volkov, remember, where there were several of the health issues that were more prominent if, if use began in early adolescence. I'm not going to go into detail with this slide. It's a bit complicated, but it's another sidebar topic because I want you to all remember that nowadays the THC level in marijuana is quite strong, much stronger than it was when our parents or grandparents used it. Um, so if, if in the 60s and 70s you were able to use marijuana or use it, you probably had a product that was three to 5% THC and typical these days is 15 to 20% THC and it can be much higher, unfortunately, if you go to some of the shops. Anyway, uh, this data showed that if somebody was using the more potent THC, it actually increased significantly the risk of having psychosis than individuals who were just using lower levels of THC. Any THC was still a risk for psychosis, but there was differential. Uh, when the authors did their best, it was not perfect, but did their best of trying to uh, separate out the two groups of psychosis individuals into, they used heavy THC marijuana versus lighter THC marijuana. Just keep in mind, all of the mental health marijuana connections are, are um, uh, indirect and need to be um, uh, thought of with caution. Um, it's quite possible people have early onset of a, of, a, of a psychosis or a mental problem and they're using marijuana to self-medicate and marijuana might not have a significant contributor or maybe it's both. Maybe someone has biological risk. That risk leads to um, emotional or cognitive issues. They find marijuana to be a relief. Um, and maybe that interacts with the um, biological vulnerability and later contributes to uh, more of problems with that disorder than somebody who had the biological risk that didn't use marijuana. All those kinds of things are complicated and they're being studied. 
I don't want us to forget about early experiences, whether they're positive or negative, on the developing brain. Um, an important quote from um, Anderson that reminds us um, the importance of impact on the developing brain. Exposure to both positive and negative elements before adolescence can imprint on the final adult topography in a manner that differs from exposure to the same elements after adolescence. Perhaps not a news bulletin. You have something that's developing the brain and there's impact from the environment that surely can have a, uh, a more uh, profound change on that structure of the brain and the function of the brain uh, while it's developing than if it, that experience occurred later in life. Now, a couple great quotes from my favorite Harvard site that I mentioned earlier on developing the child. The interaction between genetic predispositions and sustained stress-inducing experiences early in life can lay an unstable foundation for mental health that endures well into the adult years. Kind of a, a buzzkill statement, um, but is it always on the, the downside? No, there are rays of hope, as the, the Harvard site notes. Some individuals, and this is important, demonstrate remarkable capacities to overcome the severe challenges of early persistent maltreatment, trauma, and emotional harm. And also, most potential mental health problems that emerge in adolescence will not become mental health problems later if we can respond to them early. More on the importance of early treatment. So, some slides and uh, comment about how early experiences have both positive and negative effects. Um, CDC has a great site on brain development. Um, I encourage you to go to it and read how they've summarized ways in which um, so many features of growing up and the environment can promote positive brain development. Here's a sound bite from it. Nurturing and responsive care for the child's body and mind is the key to supporting healthy brain development. Interpersonal nurturing and responsive care provided by parents, adults, siblings. It could be a community. Um, perhaps not a surprise, I'm pointing you again to Harvard's site on the developing brain and developing child. And there's uh, so many um, research articles and uh, columns um, and newsletters that provide how the science on early childhood is, is, is really developing a, a sharper understanding of, of early experiences and its importance in, in healthy, healthy brain development. Here's one example from, from the literature. Luby and colleagues looked at the difference between children who had high levels of paternal support versus those that did not. And it was the mother's support that they were looking at. And they were able to do some um, neuroimaging and psychological testing at the front end baseline and then longitudinally to see if there were significant differences between groups where there was a lot of parental support and, and the group that did not have a lot. And one big finding was that the youngsters that had more parental support in the infancy, they had more enriched hippo hippocampus volume. Why is hippocampus important? That's the part of the brain that is very important for memory. And good memory can lead to all kinds of positivity for cognitive development and, and uh, emotionality. Um, and they also found that the children that had the more enhanced hippocampus volume, not only did they show better memory, but they were better at emotional regulation. So it wasn't just a cognitive outcome, an important behavioral outcome. But on the other hand, um, there can be significant impact of child traumatic stress that lasts well behind, beyond childhood. And these effects, uh, of course, impact learning, mental illness, um, and unfortunately, increased need for services. Um, one interesting study that um, was a naturalistic, but it had a, a group of orphans that, of course, are, are deprived of, of, of uh, nurturing. And it compared it to a, a, a comparison group of children that were raised by regular parents. And those that were deprived, they showed increased symptoms, symptoms in the uh, gastrointestinal area and the problems with gut 
micro, sorry, the gut microbiomes were linked to some important uh, behavioral features, more anxiety, and actually a little bit more problem in how they processed emotional faces. Um, so there's a feature where you can look at um, how well the brain reacts to uh, looking at emotional faces. And if there's overreaction to more neutral faces, that's believed to lead to a uh, risk for anxiety and more problems with coping. And unfortunately, that was one of the um, downstream problems found in these youngsters that were um, raised as orphans. Good news, that doesn't mean that they're locked into that behavior pattern because these, many of these things can be, uh, the early negative behaviors can be reversed with uh, important training and with mental health treatment. I'm gonna skip this one because it um, covers the same topic area. I wanna get to uh, an important feature about brain development and suicide um, and depression. And it, it's probably not a news bulletin to many of you that experts have warned that um, the rate of adolescents who are seriously considering committing as well as committing is increasing um, at, a, at a very disturbing rate. So for example, um, among adults, um, best estimate among Americans was that suicide was the 10th most common cause of death. But if you look at ages 15 to 24, it's the second leading cause. So definitely a, a more prominent cause in this younger age group. In my home state of Minnesota, um, a recent statewide survey reported that 13% 11th graders marked in the survey that they had seriously considered suicide. And suicide rates vary across tribes and communities, but the rates are generally much higher than in the overall population. For example, CDC reported from the survey data of 2017 that if you did an age-adjusted uh, rate computation, 51% greater among males and 80% greater among females of suicide rate compared to the general population. Now, just remember, those numbers, 51 and 80%, is not the percent that had considered suicide or was suicidal. It's the rate is that much higher um, among Native Americans compared to uh, the uh, non-Native uh, population, extremely much higher. Back to our list. You remember the list of eight? We're back to it. Um, we looked at this uh, years ago and I brought it back realizing that it's relevant to our conversation about uh, what about adolescence might be a contributor to suicidal thinking and even suicide behavior. And so these four uh, struck us. Activities with peers, con poor, poor control of emotion, poor consideration of negative consequences, and being overly attentive to social information and a tendency to take risks. So some of the natural, normal, so-called normal features of adolescence, if, if a teenager is um, you know, at a high risk, things haven't gone well. And maybe some of these four I've highlighted are particularly problematic for a youngster. This surely could elevate uh, their tendency for suicidality. There is a whole literature on number seven, being overly attentive to social information. We, we don't have time to get into all of it. It's, it's uh, worthy of several hour webinar perhaps, uh, but um, that's getting a lot of attention these days. And unfortunately, too much of it is negative. Um, if you're wanting to put a tool in your toolbox to screen for depression and suicide, I recommend this uh, well-researched public domain questionnaire. Got the website there for you. Nine items. It's been adjusted for teens. One of them screens for suicide. Here's the item, thoughts you would be better off dead or thoughts of hurting yourself in some way. That's a very effective single item, even if you don't have time for a lot of depression questions. If you, uh, that's a very worthy um, red flag question. Thoughts you would be better off or thoughts of hurting yourself. And that can get a lot of people to talk about uh, suicidality um, as opposed to shutting down the conversation. A well-researched item. And I also encourage you to uh, go to this website um, to, to look and, and realize that there's a great toolkit from the National Council of Urban Indian Health. They partnered with another group in 2015 to create a toolkit called the National Hope for Life Day Toolkit. And this resource helps community leaders, health professionals working with American Indian, Alaska Native communities to, um, to deal with depression and suicidality. 
Yeah, it's this Hope for Life Day, which is a, a day in, in September, can be a, a great um, starting point for using this toolkit. Okay. How can you take some of this information and use it to add to your toolbox? Um, I'm a big fan of teaching young people about the science of brain development and how it's important to understand these principles for health and personal growth. For example, I show this to teenagers and ask them what they think about this list. Does, does it ring true? Are there examples they have of how maybe they let activities with peers get the best of them? How maybe they're over um, concerned about novel things and that might lead to bad decisions. Of course, seven and eight are great. How social information might be uh, unfortunately something they're too preoccupied with and how taking risks can be, be negative. Um, there, there are tools to help youngsters think about how to be better at dealing with risk. Um, I call it adaptive decision making. Here's the three bullets here are just some adjectives um, describing what you know, underpins better decision making. If you're interested um, um, in more on this, Feel free to send me an email. Here's my email. And we have uh, developed a teen brain resource that you can use when you're working with groups of teenage. You can do it one-on-one -on -one as well, but it provides a little PowerPoint as well as some activity sheets. And it walks you through kind of the basics of teen brain development with um, a chance to, to play with these principles in a couple activities. Free resource, you'd get um, power, PowerPoint file and a couple Word docs. I'm a big fan of if you're going to be a prevention worker to use evidence-based programs. I've listed here three uh, free resources uh, that highlight the basic keys to evidence-based prevention. I, all of these resources are great. However, I'd say number one is probably the most digestible. You go to um, drugabuse.gov and type in evidence-based prevention programs and it will point you to the, uh, the so-called Red Book. I'm encouraging you to, whenever you can, try to um, uh, close the treatment gap for young people. The earlier the treatment, the better. The slide to the right just shows how much sooner somebody can reach um, good recovery um, as a function of the sooner they got treatment after the first problem emerged. That's the blue line. The red line is the worst case scenario where somebody waited almost 20 years to get treatment uh, uh, after their first sign of a substance use problem. And, and so perhaps not a, a news bulletin. Uh, as, as Michael Dennis says in the slide, that one's careers are shorter, the sooner a person uh, accesses treatment. Careers of, of having a problem with substance use, was his point. Um, Evidence-based treatment has now been summarized a lot. I put in red. The NIDA citation, NIDA 2014, they also published a great uh, treatment uh, handbook. If you just go to drugabuse.gov, type in um, adolescent treatment, you'll, you'll get uh, sent to the PDF. Um, the three major treatment approaches that look to be the best for teenagers based not only on NIDA's summary, but on these two other uh, literature reviews I've noted here by Hogue and Tanner Smith, motivational enhancement therapy, cognitive behavior therapy, and family therapy. Remember I mentioned it can be a plus to work with youngsters and get them to think about cannabis and vaping and perhaps work on the myths that they might be holding. If you like that idea and want to turn it into an activity in a game, the website's here where you can download a, uh, a quiz on um, myths of marijuana as well as um, CDC site about educating, you can turn their education points into a quiz. True, false, multiple choice. And as I mentioned earlier, it's a good idea to focus these days on vaping and cannabis since those are the two drugs that unfortunately seem to be um, trending upwards when we're, we're getting actually good results with other drugs in terms of trends among young people. Um, here's my slide. I work um, with parents and you're welcome to print this out and use it. I taken the word parents, turned each letter into a principle uh, that uh, provides some uh, knowledge and action for parents to be either good role models 
uh, or to use good brain science and good prevention science to raise a healthy youngster. I won't go through all of these letters, um, but each of them lends itself to discussion. So how I use the activity is I break the parents into small groups and have each group take a letter and they're asked to, in small group, come up with examples of what either they do or should be doing to advance the principle. So for the first one, all right, those parents, all right, come up with ideas of how you could um, make sure your teenager engages in activity that actually capitalizes on what's good about that adolescent developing brain. You know, they're, hopefully they come up with, oh, engage them in music, uh, uh, sports, recreation, be sociable, stay away from, you know, obsession with video games, et cetera. Anyway, and then you have the parents come back and they report on what they came up with and you turn it into a large group discussion. I can give people more information about this slide if, if you send me an email. And I also point parents when I work with them to great websites. Here's three of them. Mentor Foundation, NIDA, and drugfree.org have all developed great parent resources. They're fairly similar. They all have uh, engaging activities and videos. In summary, hopefully you've appreciated that uh, normal adolescence is an interesting time of one's life. It can be characterized by these features that I've listed here. Uh, increase in conflicts with family members, irritability, risk-taking, they're going to complain of being bored a lot, and it turns out all these features on here, which might look negative, they're actually normal, part of adolescence, and the good news is most teenagers grow out of excessiveness with this. And it's something where you remind parents, hang in there. Um, my summary about the adolescent brain development is it's the reward incentives that a teenager sees typically outweighs or dominates their thinking and decision making in contrast to whatever perception of consequences, negative consequences they may be seeing. Um, and so, the, as I said, it's more like the, the the Nike swoosh. I think there's several lines of evidence suggesting uh, that adolescence is a vulnerable period for uh, the effects of drugs and, and may be linked to uh, the onset of many uh, mental disorders. And drug use may be compounding that. Um, but it's a wonderful time to, uh, for personal growth. And many of the features of adolescent brain development can be used to, to bolster personal growth. And hopefully you found that um, you can employ this science and engage youngsters, not only just about normal development, but uh, how um, to be healthier um, might mean just you want to do your best to stay away from drugs in the teen years. Um, and if you have signs of mental illness, get help because treatment can help. Okay, my last slide, and then if people can hang around, I know I've gone to the top of the outer, I can answer questions. Um, so are there several health indices that suggest teens less risk? It turns out you could make a case that the answer to that question is true. If you look at um, the percent of teenagers that say they are going through school, all the school years without using any drugs, that rate is increasing. It's now about the high 20%. It used to be low 20%. Kind of interesting. That is, teenagers say, yep, it's illegal. I'm not doing it. I don't want to do it. Whatever reasons. The, the percent of teenagers saying that and doing that, at least reporting it on surveys, is increasing. There's also, also a lower rate of teenage pregnancies over recent years and a trending of some delinquency behaviors in the nice downward trend. What lifestyle choices, choices promote good brain development well, hopefully you've, you've seen that no drug use is on that list, but also just many things that are relevant to good health, good diet, enough exercise, sufficient sleep, and being social. Being an active person is actually quite health, healthy for, the, for brain development. It's good for, and then maintaining healthy brain as well. And what about the last two? A very interesting question. I get asked this all the time. And my answer is, it's a good question because we just don't know the answer. It might, it might vary depending on individuals. Of course, it might vary on, on how young someone started to use and what they're using and how heavy is heavy. It, there's no you know, definitive answer there. Um, they both can be very harmful, of course. Uh, my point of view is. Okay, 
I appreciate those that hung in there to the end. I know it went past a little bit. I'm more than happy if uh, if people um, uh, had any questions or there was time for it. And surely you can you can send me questions later. Thank you so much, Dr. Winters. Um, we've had lots of comments on um, how helpful this session has been. Um, there have been a few questions about some um, in incorporating more of the Native culture and how um, this might be different for Native adolescents. And I just wanted to comment that um, the, the other two parts of this series focus much more on that aspect of um, of suicide and you know issues issues with adolescence and and how culture is a a huge part of um, you know resilience for adolescents and in giving them those protective factors um, and I just wanted to read this really wonderful comment from Bessie all of this confirms how important native cultural life ways regarding traditional mothering cradle cradle boards and baby baskets and our puberty ceremony are so important. Our native life ways consist of all the tools and practices that help develop and protect the brain. Um, thought that was really well put. And I, yeah, I just wanted to encourage everyone who was wondering about um, talking about this in the context of culture more that I hope you can join us for our other sessions. Um, our next one is um, the second Wednesday in August. And so we will be talking more about um, cultural aspects that time and um, we also have the recording of the one that was done in June um, that you can also access. So we'll, we'll make sure you get that in the follow-up emails too. Um, there were a couple of questions um, earlier in the session that I wanted to go back to um, Dr. Winters. So yeah. let's see. Um, someone was asking about um, are there any novel interventions to help people with cannabis use disorder? Yes, people are studying those and have published it. And it turns out if you have a good substance or drug abuse treatment intervention program, it works with cannabis with one caveat. You, if you're going to do harm reduction, you may need to um, work hard to disabuse the teenagers of the potential health benefits of marijuana because we've given a, a medicine and health tinge, haven't we, to marijuana and cannabis these days. I mean, just the medicinal uh, uh, options for in many states have, have made it a little more difficult to convince teenagers, well, it's, it's not necessarily medicine for them. Um, so. I, that's why I like to use the cannabis IQ activity as a as an insert um, to get teenagers think out loud about the uh, the that it's not a, a healthy path. If but motivational enhancement, cognitive behavior therapy, excellent strategies because they help give teenagers coping skills so they can learn an alternative set of behaviors that replace what they're probably using marijuana for, including the peer pressure phenomenon. There is a great uh, brief intervention that just focuses on, on uh, marijuana. I will, it, for teens, I'll send it to Kate and she can pass that along, the link to that. Great, yeah, we'll make sure we include that in our follow-up email. Um, so there was one other question um, from earlier on. Um, since synaptic pruning in myelin is forming on neurons during adolescence, does this help develop skills um, in things such as music or athletics? Oh, very good. So the, the synaptic pruning and, the, and myelination, that's the other big process. Both of those help the brain be stronger in many different ways including um, promoting uh, physical coordination. It turns out these, these processes are, um, are uh, reversing an overgrowth that occurs in childhood. 
of your neural connections. Our, the wiring in our brain is a bit cluttered after childhood. Perhaps that has historical adaptive uh, basis for it. But the bottom line is you don't need all that. And it's, it's a bit cluttered. It's a bit like a tree um, getting healthier and healthier if you do a good job of pruning it throughout its years. So it promotes um, you know, emotional regulation, cognitive functioning, physical coordination, and perhaps inherent in what the person was saying, the part of the brain that's mostly devoted to physical coordination and physical skill is at the back, the cerebellum. And that is getting uh, its pruning done quite quickly in the teen years more quickly because it's a back brain region than the front brain regions. It might be one reason I've kind of kidded that maybe young people are much better at sports than they are in making a good emotional decision <laughs> uh, on one level. You could maybe make that case. That perhaps has something to do with brain development. Uh, it has a lot to do with you know muscle strength and, and other uh, uh, functions and systems in the body that are healthy and young. But um, it, it makes sense that teenagers like exercise and activity. And that's why I'm a big fan of sports in all cultures and in all schools. I just hate it when I hear schools have to cut back on sports. Oh, you know, it's, it, it's so valuable, uh, I think, for, for development. And schools are a great source of it. And communities are a great source of it. Yeah. Well, thank you. I, don't, I um, know we're over, so I don't want to take up too much more of people's time today. Um, but I just want to say a big thank you to Dr. Winters for um, sharing your knowledge about the brain and, um, and yeah, just giving us more insight on how, um, how to understand the young people around us and to, um, to have some more tools to know how to love them and to care for them. So um, I want to say thank you again for that. Thank you. I appreciate it. Kate, I'm going to add one more little footnote. Yeah. I haven't read yet anywhere where someone's been able to establish that adolescent brain development is significantly different based on ethnicity. So internationally, whenever it's been looked at, it looks this, roughly the same. Within America, westernized culture, different ethnic groups of young people, roughly the same. Which could be different in any local community or culture is, well, how much did negative or positive experiences occur and then of course that could alter downstream impact because i've seen a, a lot of great questions in the chat about you know how much similar different so far that the big factor would be well is there good nurturing is there a lot of opportunity for positive experiences or no is it the other end too stressful not much nurturing too much trauma you know etc cetera, etc cetera. those would those would contribute. I wish I could tell you I know the impact of secondary trauma on an adolescent developing brain in tribal land. I don't know. I don't know if anyone's, no one studied that. That would be an interesting one to study. I'm not, not sure how it would be done, but uh, obviously it's relevant to think about, isn't it? With the, that's that's a more specific to American Indian and Alaska Native cultures than, than other cultures. It's a very relevant question. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much for those questions and comments. And um, and uh, I, I know a few people have been asking about um, handouts of the slides. Um, if you do scroll up, you might be able to find them. I know there's been a lot of chatting, but also know that we will be sending out an email within the next few days um, that will have the handouts included and um, a link to the recording. So you can share this with others. You can view it again. Um, and uh, we'll also, you'll have the opportunity to um, request CEUs if you reply to that email. So um, that, I think, takes care of all of our um, just questions about how all of that works. But um, yeah, I see we've got a couple other questions that are coming in yet. And um, I will, I will uh, track those questions and, and hopefully we can return to those and we can um, address some of those in the next session. Um, I'll, uh, I'll ask Dr. Winters for um, his comments on some of those questions and we can um, share some of that information yeah. with all of yeah. you too. So thank you so Very much. Good. Thanks everyone. You all have the rest of a great week.
Yeah, thank you so much, Ken. And I, I yeah, I hope you all are well and um, being safe and, um, and yeah, supporting your communities. And, and yeah, I just want to thank you all again for, um, for being with us and, and we'll hope, hope to see you next time. Thanks again.